Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Bowen Stewart and welcome to the 2020 Oceania ITO seminar in conjunction with the IWF. Our speakers today include Mr. Niku Vlad, IWF Vice President and Chairman of the IWF Technical Committee. Mr. Sam Coffer, AWF President and former IWF Technical Chair. And last but not least, Mr. Pedro Sanchez, IWF Technical Member and AWF Director. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Niku Vlad. Thank you, Niku. Thank you, Bowen. Um, yes, as we uh, discuss uh, International Lightning Federation as a technical uh, chairman, I, um, I uh, practically we prepare the technical official meetings around the world. And um, now it's uh, the turn of uh, between IWF and Oceania together to have these uh, meetings. So uh, according to the um, our situation, international situation with the COVID-19, uh, I think it's uh, the, the good solution, uh, at least for this period of uh, time, to have uh, this kind of uh, seminars. Because uh, as we all know, we cannot see each other in person. It's been a long time since we did not uh, practically organize uh, any competition international because of the this situation. So um, the the best solution now is to to see each other through to the technology, um, and uh, we develop uh, this project also with uh, Oceania. So thanks to Oceanian Federation, uh, General Secretary. Paul Goff and uh, President uh, Marcus. Um, of course, uh, we involve uh, people from uh, International Weightlifting uh, Technical Committee and the Oceanian uh, Technical Committee too. Um, so, uh, for this uh, reason, um, we today we will have uh, a seminar. We will have uh, three uh, points, which uh, one of them is. Um, presented by uh, Sam Koffa. Um, uh, so uh, we, we, Sam, we will talk about uh, ethics. And uh, the other one uh, will be uh, for uh, uh, Chief uh, Marshall, which uh, will, will be explained to you guys from Gary Marshall. And the uh, technical controller will be by, done by Pedro Sanchez, which is uh, part of the technical uh, IWF technical committee side. So um, uh, I will uh, I will uh, pass to Sam to start with uh, ethics. But in the meantime, uh, I want to welcome all of you, all of you, to be part of this uh, seminar, and uh, I wish you. Uh, good luck in the stay, stay stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Niku. And we'll now hand the floor over to Sam. My name is Sam Koffer, and I'm from Australia. I took up weightlifting in 1952, soon after I migrated from Italy to Australia. We did not have any coaches in those days. We did not have gyms or clubs. So I decided to form my own club in the city of Hawthorne in Melbourne, which soon after integrated with the Hawthorne Citizens Youth Club. We flourished and we became the best club in Australia. And at one stage, we were considered to be one of the best clubs in the world. We worked hard and we learned by making mistakes. The club has turned over many world-class lifters and technical officials and administrators and is still a going concern. After my retirement from competition, I became a coach and managed and coached the Australia team to the 1970 Edinburgh Commonwealth Games where Australia won four of the seven gold medals on the program. After that, I concentrated heavily on the technical aspect of the sport. And over the years, 
I was lucky enough to be selected as an international official to many, many major IWF events and including the Olympic Games from 1992 to Rio 2016. And hopefully, I'll be one of the two technical delegates for the Tokyo 2020. I especially look forward to that as I participated in the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games as a weightlifter representing Australia. From the year 2000 to the year 2017, I served the International Weightlifting Federation as the chairman of the technical committee. And in that role, I was responsible for introducing many new rules and regulation, which I am proud to say have enhanced the technical aspect of our sport. During this period, I wrote many articles, policies, and also a booklet, which we titled Technical Officials Guidebook. It detailed the roles and responsibilities of the jury, referees, technical controllers, chief marshals, timekeepers, competition secretary, speakers, and competition doctors. I am going to present and speak to you about one of the chapters of that booklet, which deals with the definition, roles and responsibility of technical officials, touching also on the ethics of the role. So, if we can start by the definition of a technical official. A technical official is defined as any person who controls the play of a competition by applying the rules and regulation of the sport and making judgment on rules infringement, performance, time or ranking. A technical officials act as an impartial judge of sporting competitions. This involves an obligation to perform with accuracy, consistency, objectivity, and the highest sense of integrity. That is the definition of a technical officials, which you will find in the IWF records and writings. A technical officials must act as an impartial judge. This is what our booklet, our PowerPoint uh, that we are enacting now says. The technical officials must act as an impartial judge, perform our duties with accuracy, consistency, and objectivity. Display the highest sense of integrity. Ensure that the field of play, commonly known as FOP, that is FOP, the competition area, including, of course, the warm-up area and other small areas surrounding it, we must ensure that that field of play is safe for athletes and officials. We must know the rules with absolute assurance. We must apply, not interpret, the rules with our fear or favor. And we must use a degree of what I call common sense when confronted with non-technical issues. We must absolutely, we must judge what we see, not what we thought we saw. It's very simple to say, oh, I just saw that. No, you either see it or you don't see it. If you see some fault, you must judge it 
If you don't see any fault, you judge it accordingly. And we must ensure, of course, that we make the right decision when to act or when not to act. When we see a fault during the execution of a lift, we must act immediately. It is not good to allow a lifter to complete a lift when you know you're going to give a red light. That is a waste of energy on behalf of the athlete. So if you see a fault, you must act immediately. Press the red button. We must apply ourselves in a professional manner, which includes presenting a good image, being punctual, being and remaining attentive, assisting whenever and wherever possible in any area when either asked or requested, being friendly with your colleagues, and above all, we must never, never lose our nerves. Please remember, nothing else will do. And remember also, the best technical officials in the world is the one who makes fewer mistakes. The most excellent technical official in the world is the one who learns from those mistakes. Now, just a word or two about what is required from an international technical officials. Athletes, as far as I'm concerned, are the most important considerations. We must think of how we can make the environment comfortable for the athletes and, of course, according to the technical rules. Obviously, if the athletes are happy, we are happy too. We must make room that the way in is okay, are the paperwork, uh, okay, is the paperwork okay? Chairs, tables, separation um, uh, implements, you know, in order to uh, make sure that the lifters have privacy when they weigh in. Inside the warm-up room, everything is okay. Lifting order is okay. The time schedule is okay. Referees' decisions are okay. Official results okay, etc., etc., etc. All of these things are in the hands of technical officials. Technical official must know and understand the International Weightlifting Federation technical competition rules and regulation. That is so necessary for the success of the competition. If you have technical officials who are not well versed, well versed in those rules and regulations, we would have problems during the conduct of a competition. I believe also that it's incumbent upon us to consider the audience. After all, we are entertainers to a degree. We compete in front of an audience and we must show that we create a, a good image. So in order to be easy to compete, the rules, the preparation and the competition all must be really, really well prepared. The rules for the, it must be easy to understand from the audience point of view. The presentation must be excellent because, as I said, it is. It is also a, um, a show, if you like. So all of that creates good competition. If it's exciting, if it's interesting, if people mutter in their own selves, oh, I love this, I would love to try this, this is really what is the basis of the, for the development of the sport of weightlifting. We want particularly youngsters going out of the competition hall 
And when they get home, they go and look for the nearest gym service to start a career in weightlifting. That is the development of the sports. All of our technical officials are made particularly for the athletes. They must be fair. And we must make technical rules that avoid mistakes. In other words, not to be too ambiguous. Technical officials are working and checking with each other. They are working to check and recheck all the apparatus so that all of it is safe for the athletes. For the audience, the rules must be made to be easily understood. The scoreboard, the attempt board, the one kilo rule, etc., etc., they must be fairly easy to understand. Otherwise, the, 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 the audience becomes perplexed and will not understand and will not enjoy the show. Excitement also in terms of a creative announcement, uh, creative announcers, you know, colourful announcers, <clears throat> so as to create this, this sense of excitement. And also, we've got to consider, of course, television audiences and television work. You know, the sport of weightlifting used to have no time in which an athlete could perform a lift, no time at all. So competition used to go on to the all hours of the morning, and that was not good because there was no one in the audience. We then cut it down to five minutes. We then cut it down to three minutes. It is now one minute for each attempt. God knows where we will go from there. <laughs> so uh, I always think that it's easier as a technical official if you imagine yourself being the athlete or the coach or as a member of the end, of the audience because in that in that in sort of situations, it'll be easier for you to identify the problems and, if need be, solve such problems. The inside of the venues should be, number one, compliant with the technical rules. It must be safe and comfortable to work for the coaches. It must be impressive for the audience and TV and easier to work for the technical officials. Serious offences for international technical officials, quite a few. Being involved as a technical, as a team official, a team official meaning of your own country. Being light or absent from the weighing in. Competitions at world class level is not a trip, is not a cultural uh, uh, <clears throat> visit, nor is it a sightseeing trip. It is a job, it is an appointment, and it must be treated as such. Being light for introduction of officials is a no no. It is better. Always better to be 30 minutes earlier than one minute later. Returning to one's own country before the games or the championships is also a no-no. So any of what I've just repeated could result in a technical officials not being selected for future competitions. Can I offer some hints to being an exceptional technical official? Technical officials must keep athletes in completely safe circumstances. They must observe technical rules, but use a degree of common sense with non 
technical issues. A confrontation in the warm-up area could be disastrous for the conduct of the competition. Get along with other officials and help one another. If we experience difficulties, don't get angry. Analyze what happens. Be punctual. Prepare well. Solve problems. Read the International Weightlifting Federation technical competition rules and regulation again and again and again. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Unfortunately, Gary Marshall can't uh, be with us today with an illness in the family, so we'll now pass it over to Pedro Sanchez. Thank you, Bowen. Today, I will be delivering a presentation on the technical controller. The technical controller must be active and have full knowledge of the TCR, the Technical Competition Rules and Regulations, and have a very strong character. Technical controllers are required to assist the competition director and the jury president. So the jury president might call them, ask them to do something or control an event that's currently out of control. A reminder on the competition director's role. It is to control the progress of the competition. They will assign the technical officials in conjunction with the chairperson of the IWF technical committee. They will verify the athletes' entries and divide them into groups. They will supervise the drawing of lots. They will supervise the lifting order, including the operation of the technical information system. They will supervise the registration of new records. They will monitor and enforce, and enforce the 20 kilogram rule. They will verify and sign the competition protocol. The two underlying lines supervises lifting order, including TIS operation and monitors and enforces the 20 kilogram rule are deeply related to the technical controller's role. Another reminder on the jury's role. The jury's role is to ensure that the TCRR are being correctly followed and applied. They have many responsibilities. They have responsibilities inside the warm-up room, the job of the marshals, that the introductions are prepared, all those different things. But most of the roles are related to the technical controller. So the jury is heavily dependent on the technical controller to fulfill their role. When you control the competition as a technical controller, the most important thing and consideration is how to allow the athletes to concentrate. If you don't disturb the athlete's concentration, the athletes might make a good result at their level. If there are many good results, the competition will end in a big success. It will be easier if you imagine yourself as the athlete or as the coach or as a member of the audience. It will be easy for you to identify the problems and solve the problems. Be careful. The technical controller must not stand too close to the athletes. Never appear as a team official. Never appear as a spectator. As you can see from the photo on the lower right hand side, there's the coach just outside the stage area and the TV crew and the technical controller is well out of the way and out of sight. You need to consider the TV broadcasting. Never disturb the cameras and avoid being seen on TV unless for an appropriate reason. The main duties of the technical controller. Ensure the field of play and equipment are compliant with the TCRR. Ensure that all on duty technical officials wear the correct uniform. Inspect the athlete's outfit and correct when necessary. Ensures that only authorised team officials with warm-up warm -up pass holders, in other words, accompany the athletes on the field of play. Monitor the lifting order and ensure the correct athlete, according to the announcement, goes on the stage. 
monitors the change of weights in the 20 kilogram rule, controls the cleaning of the bar and the platform, ensures the athlete's safety, especially in the case of injury, assists with the victim ceremony presentation, and assists the anti-doping personnel as directed and if requested. There are many, many jobs for the technical controller to do. And because there are so many jobs, we have two technical controllers in each group. The two technical controllers must cooperate with each other. You can change the roles between each, between each other during the snatch and the clean and jerk. For example, if you have two technical controllers, technical controller A and technical controller B, before the competition, you will both together check the field of play and the equipment. Once for the competition start, one technical controller will be inside the warm up room, the other one will be near the platform. The technical controller inside the warm up room normally checks that there are the correct number of team officials in the warm up room. They continually check the changes in weight and that the 20 kilo rule is being applied. All of this cooperating with the chief marshal and they also check the outfit of the athletes. The technical controller near the platform also check that the correct number of team officials present themselves with the athlete when the athlete is going out onto the platform. They check the lifting order to ensure that the correct athlete is going onto the platform. They check the outfit of the competitor. They ensure the bar is clean and they control the platform. In particular, if there's an injury, they need to control the platform, keep team of officials off the platform. Once for the clean and jerk or before the clean and jerk, they change positions. Technical controller A goes near the platform, technical controller B goes inside the warm up room. However, this can change depending on the layout of the venue. So the role shared by two technical controllers can be quite different according to the venue layout. So in this case, as you can see, the marshal's table in the venue on the left is near the platform. Whereas in the other one, it's in the warm up area. So what differences does this make? So what needs to happen is that the technical controller is side the warm up area still checks the number of team officials, whereas the technical controller outside near the platform, because they're next to the marshal's table, needs to check the changing of the weights, the lifting order to ensure the right lifter is up on the platform, the 20 kilogram rule, ensure the bar is clean, ensure that the outfit of the competitors is correct, and in case of an injury, control the platform. On the venue on the right, where you've got the marshal's table inside the warm up area, that technical controller needs to check the changing of the weight, the number of team officials, also the correct outfit. Whereas the, the technical controller out in the blue, underlined in blue now, near the platform, needs to check the lifting order, the outfit of the competitor, the cleaning of the bar, and the number of team officials presenting themselves. And in case of an injury, control what happens on the platform. Usually it means keeping the team officials off the platform who will try and rush to go out and assist the injured athlete. Here's an example of one of the best venue layouts we, we've had. So if the venue layout is planned well, the technical controllers will have a much easier job. So in this situation here, we have two technical controllers. One's a blue star, one's a red star. So the other the one's inside the warm up room, the other one's near the platform. There's a, an entry and exit from the warm up room. You also have an official present for security at a door going out of the back of the warm up room. This controls the entry and exit of the athletes. And during the competition, that door is actually closed and very closely guarded. So 
the officials or anybody that needs to go to the toilet will have to go through that door and they need to have an appropriate pass to be allowed back into the warm-up room. The technical controller in blue will check the changing of the weight, the lifting order, the outfit of the competitors and the number of team officials in the warm-up area. The tech, technical controller out near the platform will check the outfit, the lifting order and in case of injury ensure that the platform area is controlled as well as cleaning of the bar. The technical control needs to ensure that the field of play and equipment are compliant with the TCRR. The inside of the venue should be compliant with the TCRR, safe and comfortable for the athletes, easier to work for the team officials, impressive for the audience and TV, easier to work for the other technical officials. Check the field of play and equipment before the competition. Note, the field of play includes the warm-up area. The plates, bars, collars, magnesium, rosin. Ensure all of these are not missing. There is enough of them and they are clean. Ensure the stage is safe. There are no nails protruding anywhere or stables loose or gaps where someone can trip or fall into. Ensure the bars are clean and the platform is clean. All the bars and platforms in the warm-up room as well apply here. So ensure that there's appropriate uh, equipment to do the cleaning in terms of brushes, mops, disinfecting in case we get blood on the bar. The, need, the venue needs to be clean, no garbage lying around. The broadcasters will pick this up in the cameras. People will see it, it will not look good. Secure the warm-up area. Security personnel needs to control all entry and exits into the warm-up area. There needs to be monitors in the warm-up area and they need to be switched on. Key ones are the scoreboard, the attempt board, and the large screen showing the lifting that's going out on the, going on on the platform on the stage. Ensure that there are red and white flags for referees on the referees tables. If you find any problem, report them to the jury president or the competition director so they can help you to solve the problems. Ensure all on duty technical officials wear the correct uniform, which is navy blue jacket, navy blue trousers and skirt or skirt, a white shirt, IWF tie or scarf, dark or black blue belt, sorry, a black or dark blue belt for men, a black or dark blue socks for men, a black or dark blue or beige socks for women while wearing trousers, black, black dark blue or beige stockings for women while wearing skirts, black dress shoes, the IWF technical official metal badge pinned on the left lapel of the jacket, the I, IWF technical official badge soon on the left breast pocket. At multi-sport games, ex, excluding the Olympic Games, only the uniform issued by the organising committee may be worn. Inspect the athlete's outfit and correct when necessary. You must inspect the outfits before the snatch, before the clean and jerk and during the competition in the warm-up area. Athletes can change their outfit in a second if you're not careful. If the warning is early, they have enough time to change. There are two technical controllers in each group. You must cooperate effectively with each other. The proper out for the proper outfit, refer to the other IWF technical committee productions and study them carefully. There is the athletes of the outfit and clarification of TCRR athletes outfit. If you have to warn the athletes, the earlier the better. Checking the outfit should be finished before the calling. Observe the athlete's outfit on their way to the platform. Never go up on the platform to give a warning. It doesn't look good. It looks terrible to everybody, the media and the spectators. The lifting order gives you a hint to be smart so you can always try and preempt who's gonna be the next lifter. 
ensure only authorised team officials accompany, accompany the athletes. One athlete, three passes. Two athletes, four passes. Any additional athlete, two passes per athlete for combined, combined categories and, and events. In this situation, if you have one athlete, it's three passes. A second athlete gets one pass. A third athlete gets an additional two passes. A fourth athlete gets an additional two passes. So for two athletes, you'll have four passes. For three athletes, you'll have six passes. And for four athletes, you'll have eight passes. Note, these are the passes for team officials. In other words, coach, manager, doctor, masseur, interpreters, etc. The athlete passes is issued for the competing athletes. One pass per athlete. It's a different pass. It's a tough job, but controlling the numbers of team officials in the warm-up area is critical. Otherwise, it can become a very unsafe area. So you, you count the number of athletes per team on the scoreboard or real display system. If the warm-up passes are not well prepared, designed, it will be difficult to control it. And you have to count the team officials team by team. Observe inside the warm-up area. Observe who is of which team and doing what. If you're suspicious, request them to wear the proper pass. No pass and there's an extra official, request them to leave the warm-up area. If they don't listen to you, don't give up. If the venue layout is not planned well, such officials may cheat you repeatedly. If they still don't abide after you ask them to leave, report them to the jury president. The jury president has the power to reprimand and or sanction them. Continually monitor the lifting order to ensure the correct athlete goes onto the stage. Listen to the announcements. Look at the attempt board. Check the athlete's beep number. Observe the scoreboard monitor from time to time to see which athletes will be called next so you can be prepared. Also, this is your last opportunity to check the outfit of the competitor before they go on the platform. So ensure you look at that. Refer, refer to the other IWF technical committee documentation and study it carefully. You are not the police, therefore don't act like the police. There are technical controllers who stop athletes from going up on the station until the clock starts. This can disturb the athlete's con concentration and it looks ugly and might disturb the TV broadcasting also. Don't be like a policeman or a gateway keeper. You are not to stop the athlete. Athletes may go up on the stage once they are called. Under the rules and regulations 7.8.7, .7, technical controller's duty, ensure the correct athlete, according to the speaker's announcement, goes on the competition platform stage, even during the loading of the barbell. Make the athletes comfortable. Do not disturb them. Note, you must stop the athlete if they are going to the stage, onto the stage before they are called. Don't touch the athletes. Use words, gestures and eye contact. Touching, touching athletes can also disturb their concentration, especially just before their attempts. Even if you must stop athletes going up on the stage for some good reasons, Use cooperative methods. Try to stop them by using words, gestures, and eye contact. If any problem with the outfit of the athletes, advise the coaches, don't approach the athlete. Monitor the change of weights and the 20 kilogram rules. Work with the chief marshal on this. It's critical that the weights all change in the appropriate manner according to the rules and the 20 kilogram rule is maintained. Refer to the other IWF technical committee products and study them carefully. The chief marshal documentation and the 20 kilogram rule documentation. Control the cleaning of the bar and the platform, but avoid yourself going up on the stage unnecessarily. If the loaders find blood, 
the lotus can clean the blood off the bar immediately by using disinfectant. It's not, it's not always necessary to ask the technical controller to check the bar. Let the lotus check the bar periodically to see if there are spots of blood. Talk with the lotus in advance. Ensure the athlete's safety. Technical controllers must stop team officials from going up on the stage when an athlete suffers an injury. Only the competition doctor can touch the athlete in case of injury. The jury will stop all actions until the competition doctor finish their ex finishes their examination on the platform. Only by the order of the competition doctor can technical officials or team officials help the injured athlete. Why, you might ask. If the athlete has a fracture, or if the athlete has hit their head on the floor, or if their barbell has fallen on the neck, and if the team officials or loaders carry the athlete off the platform, they may compound the problem. They may cause a more serious injury or disability. Technical controller must stop team officials to go before they go up on the stage. So please don't go up on stage. Let anybody go up on stage except for the doctor. Talk with the loaders in advance, never touching that injured athletes unless directed by the competition doctor. The loaders are nice to hide the injured athletes during the doctor's quick examination. Here's an example where they stand in front of the bar. Sometimes screens are used like on the lower right hand side. So please um, give some privacy to the athlete and the doctor. Assist in the victory ceremony preparation. You should cooperate with organisers for the victory ceremony preparation. Check the official results and find who are yeah, who are the medalists? Assemble the medalists. You might need to wait for the athletes for a while for the doping control procedure. Please make sure medal winners cannot take electronic device on the podium, in particular mobile phones. Medal winners cannot be accompanied by any other persons. No papa, no mama, no babies. Participants of the Victory Center must not use it for political, racious, racial or religious demonstrations. At the event where VPT, video playback technology is used, the VPT has two possibilities. The jury starts a VPT review. A team challenges which initiates the VPT review. Note. In the case of a challenge, the technical controller must stop the clock immediately. Immediately, The technical controller must check the validity of the VPT quickly. The validity checks at the start of the VPT must be before the timing clock is started for the next attempt or the next, uh, next athlete having been called appears on the stage, whichever is the last. What does this mean? If the next athlete hasn't been called yet, it's valid. VPT can start. If it's the athlete has been called, but the clock hasn't been started yet, it's valid. If the athlete has been called, the clock has been started, but the athlete is not on the stage, it's valid. If the athlete has been called, the athlete is on the stage, but the clock hasn't been started yet, because the loaders are still on the platform, it's valid. The athlete has been called, the clock started, the athlete is on the stage, it is not valid. You cannot do a VPT review. Some more tips. When you stay beside the platform, keep, an eye, keep eye, eye contact with the jury. Have a look at the jury table after each attempt. The v for VPT, decision reversals, bar cleaning, outfit issues, etc. It can be any number of issues that the jury may want to call their attention and get you to approach them so you can do a job. The jury may stop the competition. When the jury president looking at other, is looking at the other members of the jury left and right, seriously, the jury is likely to stop the competition. When 
a jury reverses the decision, mostly you, mostly you will be called to the jury table and asked to deliver the information to TIS, the TIS operator, the speaker, the relevant team and the marshal's table. Cooperate with your colleague, the other technical controller. When the competition is stopped and you're called by the jury, ask your colleague to come near by the stage so as not to allow any athletes to go up on the stage. When you are in the warm up area, keep the warm up area control first, but try looking at the referee's decisions every time they make. Something might happen, especially a 2 1 or 1 2 red white situation. Try always listening to the announcements. Something may happen when there's a stop or some strange force in the announcement. When you feel or sense something is unusual, double check with your colleague, the other technical controller. Cooperate with your colleague, the other technical controller. Whenever you find a competition is stopped, go to your colleague, take them and be ready for any request. Thank you for your time today and back to you, Bowen. Thank you, Pedro. We'll now hand it back to you for your second presentation. Thanks, Bowen. I will now present the Chief Marshal. The Chief Marshal needs full knowledge, skill and concentration. The Chief Marshal's duty is to accept or refuse the modification made by the coaches on the attempt to be taken, to communicate the information to the competition management system operator about the requested attempts. At Olympic Games, Youth Olympic Games, World Weightlifting Championships and universities, the Chief Marshal must speak English, have an International Category 1 referee licence and be appointed by the IWF. The Marshal's best practice is the process whereby black and red pens are used. So the coaches will use red black pens and the Marshal will use a red pen. As you can see here, the Marshal has circled a successful attempt in the first attempt and then the second change wasn't required or used, therefore it's crossed out. On then the automatic increment of 121 is written in by the marshal, and then the 130, which was an unsuccessful attempt, is crossed out by the marshal. The coach had put in 130, marshal crossed it out after it was a no lift, and there were no changes taken, first or second changes. Then the automatic attempt was the same as the second attempt which was unsuccessful of 130 and the marshal has written that in and the lift has been successful and the marshal has circled back as a successful lift. Between the snatch and the clean and jerk it's important that the marshal calculates the weight of the clean and jerk according to the 20 kilogram rule and writes it clearly by using bold red pen. So you see here where the 140 is written in there and it's circled. So this example here, the first attempt of the snatch was 120 kilos. The declared entry total was 280 kilos. So from that, we subtract the 20 kilos, which gives us 260 kilos. And then we subtract 120 kilos, the first snatch from the 260 kilos which gives us a 140 kilo minimum clean and jerk required. The athlete's cards compared to the scoreboard screen. The transfer of information may not have been recorded correctly at any time during a competition from the athlete's cards to the scoreboard screen. Therefore, the Chief Marshal needs to compare the weights on the cards and the scoreboard screen from time to time. If any corrections are required, contact the competition management system operator immediately. The competition management system is also referred to as TIS, T-I-S, the technical information system. It is important that the chief marshal fully understands 
the rules and regulations 6.6.6 and 6.6.10. The chief marshal must check the change is valid or not by checking the other athlete's attempt. The calling order rule must be respected. Here we have four athletes, start numbers from one to four. They have, they have each entered 150 as their first attempt. The first athlete is called at 150 and is successful. The automatic increment goes to 151 kilos. They put in a declaration of 155 kilos. The second athlete is called for 150 and is also successful. The automatic increment is 151 kilos and they make a declaration of 160 kilos. The third athlete is also called for 150 and is also successful. The automatic increment again is 151 kilos and a declaration is made of 155 kilos by the coach. The fourth athlete is called for 150 kilos, is also successful. Automatic attempt is 151 and the coach makes a declaration of 160. The first athlete is called to the platform on 155, is successful. They get the automatic increment of 156 and the declaration is made with 160. The third athlete has called for 155 as a declaration. But after the clock has started on 155, number two comes in for a change to 155. But this is not possible because this would break the order of calling. The clock has started. Once the clock has started, you can't break the order of calling. So the Chief Marshal must deny it. Let's review the TCRR, Technical Competition Rules and Regulations, 6.6.6. Remember the calling order. The weight of the barbell, the lightest weight comes first. The number of the attempt, the lowest number comes first. The sequence slash order of the previous attempts, the athlete who lifted earliest is first. The start number of the athlete, the lowest first. 6.6.10, even though the request of change follows the calling order, TCRR 6.6.10 has been applied for the deadline of decreasing. In order to decrease the weight, the clock must not have started for the athlete. So pay, pay attention to the timing clock. 6.6.12, the chief marshal must look at the time clock when coaches of called athletes come to declare or increase their weight. Normally, or on a one minute attempt, a normal one minute attempt, everything must be done within the first 30 seconds. On successive attempts, in other words, a two minute clock, declaration for the next attempt must be within the first 30 seconds. The change of the weight must be made before the last 30 seconds. So the two changes must occur before the last 30 seconds but the changes will only be available if the coach or athlete declared the next weight within the first 30 seconds, even if it is the same as the automatic weight. Let's review TCRR 6.6.12. In successive attempts, a two minute call, the coach must declare the next weight to the marshals within the first 30 seconds of the two minute, minute event even if it is the automatic increment. Otherwise, the athlete has to accept the weight shown by the competition management system. An important remark here, the timing apparatus will sound two times, at the first 30 seconds and at the last 30 seconds. If the coach declared, they can change the weight two times until the last 30 seconds. As an example, the lifter has succeeded one, with 100 kilograms at the first attempt. Sam Koffer 
101 second attempt automatic increment. The coach comes and declares 101 or more for the second attempt. The coach comes to make a change to 105 for the second attempt. That is the first change. The coach comes to change to 102nd for the second attempt. That is the second change. Once the bell goes, no more changes can be made. You only receive two changes. The athlete succeeded with 100 kilo at the first attempt and they want to take 101 for the second attempt. It is not necessary for the coach athlete to declare 101 on the athlete's card if they are certain they will take the attempt at 101 kilogram because their next attempt will be 101 kilograms automatically. But if there is no declaration made within the first 30 seconds, the athlete must take the automatic increment, for example, 101 kilograms in this case. Be aware, the automatic increment applies in the following. One kilogram up after the good lift in the previous attempt, the same weight after the no lift in the previous attempt, and here's the example on the automatic increment. The lift is successful on the first attempt with 120. The automatic increment gives them 121. The lift is unsuccessful with 130. The automatic weight is 130 for the third attempt. After 30 seconds, Except well, no one comes within the first 30 seconds for the third attempt. So therefore what the marshal does, he can strike out any unused space on the athlete's cart. As you see here, circled in yellow, the two vertical lines. Always remember the 20 kilogram rule. Rules and regulations 6.6.5. The total weight of the starting attempts declared and taken in the snatch and clean and jerk must equal or exceed the weight of the verified entry total, minus 20 kilos. In this example, a woman with an entry total of 205 kilo, the total of the first attempts must not be lower than 185 kilograms. So starting attempts of 85 snatch and 100 keen and jerk is okay. It's 185 exactly. Starting snatch 75, clean and jerk 110 is okay. It's not lower than 185, it's exactly 185. Starting snatch of 82, clean and jerk of 100 is not okay because it totals 182, which is lower than the 185, which is the entry total minus 20 kilos. Please do not get the entry total confused. As an example here, entry total of 205 kilograms for women, the snatch is 85, clean and jerk 100 at the weigh-in. That's what was declared on the weigh-in form. Snatch first attempt, 85 is good. Second attempt, 82 is good. And third attempt, 90 kilos is good. So they've actually done 90 kilos as a total. So the coach might get the idea that they can decrease the clean and jerk by five kilos on the first attempt of the clean and jerk because so they try and go from 100 to 95. But no, you can't do this. The total must be calculated by the first attempts, not by, by the maximum weight you were successful with in the snatch. So it's the addition of the attempted weights in the first attempts in the snatch and the clean and jerk that must meet the 20 kilo rule. During the snatch, if the chief marshal notices the error in the warm up area, they should suggest to the athlete or coaches, if you want to decrease the first attempt snatch, you have to increase the first attempt of the clean and jerk. This is assuming they are right on the limit. You ask them that, give them the opportunity to make the correction. During the clean and jerk, if the chief marshal or technical controller notice the error in a woman, they should suggest to the athlete or coaches, you have to take the first attempt with X number of kilos or more. Always remember, the IWF 
test system, which is the technical information system, the competition management system. When it's used, if some athletes need to adjust a 20 kilo rule, the monitors for the TIS operator, Marshall's table and jury, jury table show the warning sign, 20 kilo problem. And it tells you exactly, as you see highlighted in red. It's a warning message. You'll see both as a clear reference, all circled in yellow. TO's position by the monitors is much checked from time to time especially. So Chief Marshal, the technical controller and the jury members will see this. Therefore, they need to keep an eye out for this constantly. When many coaches come to the table at the same time, the, the, and the call's been, in this example here, there's a call on 150 kilos. You've got four changes being requested from 150 to 151, from 150 to 155, from 152 to 155, and from 150 to 149. You need to deal with the lowest weight and or earliest athlete to be called first. And don't forget to check the timing clock, the validity of the weight, the time, and the calling order. So in this case, you would do number five of 149 first, and then number two, and one at 151. So that's how you start, not by who comes to the table first. So stay calm, no need to care who came to the table first. Checklist summary, validity for decreasing. Quick decision must be made in this case because the change is coming quick and the bar moves up quick. The current weight, for example, the request for 155 kilos is valid if the other athlete has already is invalid. The request for 155 kilos is in if the other athlete is already lifting 156 kilos or more. The timing clock. The request for 155 is invalid if she, he was called for 156 and the clock has already started running. The sequence of the competition, for example, number two takes 130, 150, 150, and then is requesting 155. Number three is take, has been successful, 130, 145, and is taking 157 next. The request for number three to 155 is invalid if number two has been called for 155 kilos and the timing clock has already started for number two. The reason being that number three, if he's taking 155, would have been called before number two. But number two has already been called on 155. So number three and the clock has started. So number three cannot take 155. The 20 kilogram rule is the first attempt of clean and jerk. Tips to stay calm. Prepare your own red and black pens. Concentrate always on the current weight of the barbell, the announcement and the timing clock. Compare weights on the cards and the scoreboard monitor from time to time. Put a black pen on the next athlete card to be ready for quick changes. Be prepared for possible decreasing as much as possible. Thank you for your time today. Back to Bowen. Thank you, Pedro. We're now at the end of the seminar and we'd like to thank our speakers for today, Niku, Sam and Pedro. And we'd also like to thank the General Secretary, Mr. Paul Coffer and the Oceania President, Marcus Stevens, for organising this seminar. If you have any issues, have any questions, please reach out to us at the Oceania Weightlifting Federation. Thank you. Bye for now.